my uh, big pleasure to welcome a, a friend of mine, uh, someone I met in grad school and someone that I uh, respect immensely, uh, painter Scott Everingham. He's from Toronto. He has a uh, degree from NASCAD, a BFA from NASCAD, an MFA from Waterloo. Um, he has shown a numerous galleries, in particular in the last five years uh, in Ontario and Quebec. Um, Scott's a three-time finalist for the RBC uh, Painting Award. Um, I believe, really, in, in my opinion, he's just getting better and better with time, kind of arcing his career. And in our bigger discussion about what practice looks like and how it feels to be involved in, in the art world proper, um, Scott has a lot to share. Uh, so please give a warm welcome for Scott Everingham. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me, of course. It's a pleasure to be here and chat about painting. Um, one thing that Colin failed to mention was that I did my foundation years at Fanshawe College, actually, and then was transferred over to NASCAD, which, uh, you know, NASCAD's one of those sort of schools that everybody's just packed into one area, and the entire faculty is just, you know, everybody's there in the middle of the city, and it, it ends up being a, a really good community to sort of grow and to build, and um, essentially I, I finished my finished up my degree there, uh, and then took off for a little while, went to Asia to travel, um, and didn't really consider starting my master's for a couple of years just to, you know, to work and to weigh things out and, and see where things were going to go. Um, then, it, then it came on, uh, Waterloo came up to do my master's at, and, and Waterloo's, I think, unique in that they have a program that allows the artist to choose any artist in the world to go work with uh, for six weeks. And so, you know, you give the faculty a, a list, you give the department a list, they, um, whoever, wh whatever artist says yes first is sort of the artist that you go work with. So, um, it was quite a quite a changing time for me. During, obviously, during an MFA, is you're, you're continuously working through things and you're going through ideas. Um, the artist that I worked with was uh, Nathan Redwood from Los Angeles, and uh, he kind of like, you know, we, we had a one-on-one -on -one hands-on studio work together, uh, you know, helping him, helping him out with stretching and gessoing and working on some canvases, and I was able to come back and sort of complete the last parts of my, sorry, complete the last parts of my MFA. Um, and a lot of my work at the time, uh, after coming back from L.A., dealt with a lot of uh, immediacy in painting and a lot of um, uh, you know kind of making marks and being happy with them and sitting back and not fussing with too much inside of painting um, the things that were influencing me at the time were fiction and uh, sort of fictional films and fictional stories and I sort of grew up reading short stories and you know the entire gamut of Stephen King and Clyde Barker and things that were kind of fantastical and um, not just storytelling, but very fictional and very, you know, things that were kind of unreal. Um, and so this kind of influenced the painting in that I wanted to create these, I wanted to create imagery that allowed an audience into a fictional situation, as well as, as being immediate with uh, the painting process. And so the first few paintings, uh, the first paintings that were done during my MFA, um, were sort of these ambiguous shapes and forms in very theatrical settings. Things that you're able to experience, uh, you're able to kind of experience from afar and that you're kind of looking at it and you're watching it and you're seeing what's going to happen and it's telling a bit of a narrative and it's telling a bit of a story. I was interested in uh, some balance and I'll talk about balance a little bit later as well. Um, and the, Kind of including um, just little bits of reference that you can kind of you know recognize. You can recognize stage settings and planks and boards and things you can step on and areas that you can actually exist in. And yet, you know, they're very kind of these fictional spaces that don't really have a uh, a concrete footing in them. Um, and, and I guess one of the things. Being in Waterloo, um, like I always wanted to just show my work in Toronto. I wanted to be like, you know, get into the scene and get involved and, and really get out there. And I, I learned very quickly that 
um, you can only go so fast, and it, it's, it's a very big patience game. Um, but one of the opportunities that I took care of was, was to show my MFA work in a gallery in Toronto, and it was this tiny, tiny space. Um, if you know Paul Petro Contemporary Art, um, he sort of had this kind of side project down the street that was, you know, was, what, 15 by 15 or something. So everybody kind of crammed into the space. But it was an opportunity to get shown in Toronto, and it was one of those things that I really wanted to do was to get out of Waterloo, um, you know, get into an area where more eyes would be on the work. And, and I feel like when you finish an MFA or when you're getting through your MFA, you really want, um, I don't know, I did anyway, I wanted like my work to be seen by as many people as possible just because that's the nature of getting through it. It's like you're working, uh, you're producing, and you want to sort of have this display of your final works. Um, not just for your defense, not just for your, the faculty or the other students, but for other people to kind of give you as much feedback as possible. Um, and so that, you know, that, that gave me a, a decent amount of it. Um, I, I think after an MFA as well, it's like you're, you're kind of looking for, um, I don't know, maybe a little bit more, what, what other opportunities there are. One of those opportunities, of course, is the RBC Painting Competition, which I encourage everybody to apply to if you haven't already. Um, and if you don't know much of the rules of that, it's kind of like they will accept applications five years after you graduate. And so I applied to the RBC Penny Competition during my, like after my BFA from NASCAD. Um, you know, nothing kind of happened with that until, um, I guess it would have been April or May, I think is the deadline for the applications. My show happened in February, so I had a couple months just to kind of like still work in, in the space and still produce some imagery. So um, after this show, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm assuming that it's it's like this for some artists. It's like you have a show, and then you you just want to sit back and like take a breather and relax and kind of do whatever. Um, and I did that for a couple of weeks, but then I kind of worked into some some pretty major pieces, some larger works, and this was the first work that got into RBC. Uh, which showed at the Musée des Beaux Arts in Montreal. Um, so, it, it, obviously, I felt extremely fortunate and, and very lucky to get into it, and I was absolutely thrilled that my work was going to be seen by a sort of different uh, different set of people. Um, and I guess throughout this kind of work, and if I just kind of look at this piece in in particular, a lot of it. Um, a lot of it has to do with the kind of, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of chance happening, and there's a lot of, uh, um, I was looking at failure in a painting, not necessarily, obviously not necessarily how the painting will fail, but how uh, the structures and the figures inside of that painting will fail. And I was kind of building these architectural spaces uh, with a kind of airiness and a space that didn't have really a grounding to give that sense of like, you know, what's going to happen. Either it's, it's kind of blowing apart or it's coming together. And ultimately, my work kind of had this uh, figurative element to it. If you can imagine the central being being a, a form, uh, on the right is kind of this unusable cane, for example. It's like those little things that I was looking at to, to give a sense of uneasiness and a sense of uh, not having a grounding, I guess. Um, and, and a lot of it was based on, you know, kind of, not based on, but influenced by um, the spontaneity of just putting paint down. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of mark making in, in a lot of work that I did through my MFA in the year after that, you know, maybe I look back and I'm not quite happy with, but at the time I was really focused on uh, sort of making a mark and moving on, making a mark and moving on, rather than Rather than spending too much time on it and exploring that, I, I would really kind of push through it and build a space um, kind of some, from scratch. So the, there was no drawing for this. There was no preparation for this. I essentially start at a white canvas and go from there. Um, and I say spontaneity, but I, I also want to say that it's a little bit of a controlled spontaneity so that I kind of understand what's happening and I'm making decisions as I go. So that's it there at the Musée de Beaux-Arts. Um, actually, the painting on the left 
is Sasha Pierce, who will give a, a talk of her work next week. Okay. Um, and of course, when you get accepted into RBC, they let you sit and chew your fingernails for like five months until you have the actual event. So during that time, I was, you know, obviously still producing and still making work and just trying to just investigate space, investigate how abstract forms and abstract strokes are able to represent a kind of three-dimensional three -dimensional space that I could walk into, that I could experience. Um, just to, I guess, give you an idea, you can kind of see the scale on that one. This is about a 50 by 40, and this is a 20 by 20. Um, and like I said, like these kind of like white, massive paintings that I would just kind of walk into, um, a lot of it was prepared by, uh, of course, reading. So I was reading a lot of fiction and reading specific stories to influence these, you know, a body of work or a series of paintings. And this is kind of just a random page out of a, out of a sketchbook where, you know, I'm working in thumbnails and working with just little lines and drawings and just kind of working out weights and scales and things like that to inform the larger works. And I kind of work in a, I guess, a sketchbook format the same way that I would have painted. Um, I come to this one, the image on the left, um, the sketch on the left is the sketch that I created right before my next slide. So you'll, you'll be able to kind of see how, how, honestly, how little information in this sketch actually transfers to the painting. But it was seriously one of the works that I, I you know, one of the paintings that I based on that sketch on the left. And it kind of ends up being that. Um, and this is a 72 by 60, I believe. Yeah, 72 by 60. And all of this kind of came to be just by just by making moves as I went. And it wasn't, um, you know, generally there's a background and generally there's uh, a kind of a depth that I want to create. Um, but ultimately it was really about creating um, something that an audience was also able to experience and step into and have this, this kind of feeling of like, where am I and what am I doing in this kind of, you know, strange environment. Um, and I guess one thing was um, during, like, when, when, if anybody here gets into the RBC, they also send you to the art fair in Toronto, which I think is uh, one of the most valuable places to be uh, during the art fair, just to, just to walk around and mingle and see work and just be influenced by it. It's pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I went into a space uh, from Montreal, Gallery Trois Point, and chatted with the director about some of her work. Um, obviously, you don't want to go in there with business cards and just, you know, this is my stuff. You kind of want to, like, form a relationship. And um, we just kind of chatted about stuff, and I mentioned, oh, I've got a, you know, a piece over in the RBC lounge kind of thing if you want to check it out. That was it. Uh, four or five days later, I followed up on an email um, with a link to the website. And fortunately, uh, she wrote back saying, this is, like, work that I really want to exhibit. And I was like absolutely thrilled that it happened so soon after finishing my, my master's. Um, and so we kind of were in conversation for about a year before I had a show. And, and that's the thing that I wanted to mention as well, is that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, that patience is a, is a huge part of it. And there's something about um, keeping a kind of integrity while you're producing work and while you're putting work out there or exploring you know, venues that you could show at. Uh, integrity is key. And throughout this, and you can still see this kind of figurative element in here, even though it's a single line. Um, you know, for me, that took on this very kind of human form. Um, and it, it almost was a mirror for the audience sitting in this space and like, this is a habitable environment that you can actually sit in and, you know, kind of wander around. So these are about 42 by 36. I think all the while as well, I mean, as a, as a painter, I'm, I'm continuously 
uh, just investigating the material and finding out what it can do and what it can't do, um, and working with that in, in certain strokes, in certain areas, blends, whatever it may be. The thing that I found about, um, about fictional stories is that, you know, you sit, in, you sit there and read something and you get so immersed in, in a, a short story or a novel that you know, you're totally lost and I, I feel like I wanted to kind of replicate that in a painting and you know, allow people to kind of get lost in these spaces. Um, and titles, I think, played a really strong part of that as well. This one's called Phantom Phantom Limb, so it's kind of a, you know, obviously I think you can, you can see that there's a pretty clear figure there with point at it, but like hips and legs and, and a bit of an arm and a kind of a head that are just kind of created by uh, this action of painting. It's almost a, um, like sometimes I consider it a performance painting almost. So it was getting on to, um, I guess, being in communication with this gallery in Montreal to really, really kind of like like build this first show, and I, I considered it my first solo show outside of uh, outside of my masters, and so I was holding it really tight, and I was like, this is this is my main show, like I don't know, it just felt like it felt pretty huge, um, and I was really happy with the work that was happening at the time, um, and. I also felt that because, I've, because I had this big space to fill, I had 1,600 square feet maybe of, of wall space, um, yeah, I really wanted a, a show to feel cohesive, I wanted the works to kind of work together and not be so disparate, kind of like, you know, these kind of separate entities, I wanted them to kind of feel like they're in the same kind of narrative. Um, Okay, and this piece, I guess, this was like a full year later when I applied to RBC again because I didn't win the first, second, or third award, and, and if you don't win, you can keep applying. So this is my second year applying, and this was the piece that, that got into it, and I was a little bit floored. I was a little bit like, second year in a row, I, I honestly felt like way, like almost too lucky, almost, and I, I because the jury changes all the time, it's based on... Uh, how they feel at the time. It's like it's three people from each division of the country that decides on five painters per per area. So there's one in the east, one in the west, and one central. Um, anyway, this work this work got shown at the power plant, um, and again, um, I guess dealing with failure. So it's that that's part of that's truly part of kind of moving along in a career as well is like being able to uh, absorb that kind of thing and. and being up at the front and not hearing your name was kind of, uh, but then you kind of grow with that and you build it and you think, whatever, I'm just going to make great paintings. Um, and so this was one of the works in the show that I had in Montreal, which was um, very shortly after the second RBC painting competition. Um, and it was based on a, um, a short story by Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez, if anybody knows his writing. Um, it was a story called um, The Story of a Shipwrecked Sailor. And it was this, this idea that this guy, well, not an idea, but it was a true story of this guy that was st uh, stuck in a raft for 11 days on the ocean, uh, no food or water, surrounded by sharks. Um, and it was, it was kind of like this moment of like loneliness that I thought I need to sort of make some paintings that have to do with, uh, with water, with uh, kind of being out in this vast ocean. Uh, so this one's called At the Mercy of the Sea, and it's a 72 by 60. Um, and I think what you can tell is that it's, it's, there's quite a lot of balance happening. There's a lot of things that are replicated and a lot of, a lot of doubling going on. And I wanted, I guess what I was thinking at the time is that I wanted to use that doubling and the balance to kind of give an entry for an audience to feel a little bit of comfort um, so that it wasn't this, you know, 100% abstract space that you were kind of able to enter into it and be a little bit like, okay, I get it, it's, it's this, it's this, something's happening, like, there's, there's something that happens with a doubling that kind of balances things out, and um, I was really involved in that in painting. Um, I thought that it was important. So I've got a couple works of the same series of this, the same show. 
This one's called 10,000 Leagues. It's kind of underwater almost. There's a, I don't know if that's a narwhal or something kind of buried underneath the water, but um, essentially it's like, you know, these things kind of organically formed on their own and, and the decisions being made with color and the decisions being made with balance and composition, um, you know, I was really kind of trusting in, in the, the formal elements of painting that I had picked up along the way to make, to help make these decisions. Um, I guess from, from there, um, I think it was uh, maybe five or six months later, I was in conversation with the director of the Thames Art Gallery in Chatham, where I grew up. So I obviously went to high school there, um, went to public school there, and it was this kind of public gallery that was always this, you know, beautiful floors and beautiful walls. And, um, you know, I think... I think that you can approach a curator or a director in a certain way by email and you know, possibly get a response. I'm not saying it will always happen, but it, it was nice to be able to be in conversation with him because he had known my work from, uh, from what was happening in Waterloo or he had seen it from the RBC painting competition. Anyway, we agreed that let's do a, let's do a big show in, uh, at the Thames Art Gallery. And this was my first public show. And I, uh, Pretty amazing experience where I was able to like, you know, have a lot of high school friends back and some high school art teachers back, which was really weird because they gave me D's, but I don't know. Um, it was a cool experience. It was a lot of fun, and it was at this time that I started to really pull in architecture into my pieces and to kind of break away a little bit from this kind of free organic movement and actually become a, just a touch more structured with uh, with the painting itself. And part of that was because this series that you're seeing was based on a, a novel by Jose Saramago called The Stone Raft. And it's essentially the story about Spain and Portugal that breaks off from Europe and it starts spinning in the Atlantic. And there's five people on this, this sort of island that have lost everything. And they're trying to make it together. And there's a dog and they're traveling throughout things. And it's like a lot of it is, is about not having, um, not having a, a place to stay and a grounding. And I really, I really connected with that story, and so I kind of made these paintings. Um, they were heavily influenced by this story as well. Um, so yeah, the, sh the show that I, I made for, it was, um, I guess it wasn't a show, I was just producing paintings. It was called um, All Stones Can Be Moved, and that's some of the work that you see there. So it was initially made for this. And there were a lot of like temporary homes and temporary habitations, like birdhouses and tents and cabins and hotels, and things that had these kind of very structural architectural elements to them. That took me a little bit away from the freedom of these huge strokes, and I, I sort of was, I guess, owning in on uh, on simplicity. And you'll see in later works how far that simplicity has come, but. Um, yeah, I was trying to create this space with as few strokes as possible. This one's called Canopy. It's uh, 56 by 48. And this is the first time that I actually ventured into horizontal paintings because I was so stuck on doing a vertical painting. I just felt like I'm, I'm a vertical painter. Like, that's just kind of how it is. And it's those kind of, like, those, uh, I guess, assurances or comforts in sticking with something that can be a complete burden and yet it's blind to you. And it's sort of one of those things that you need to break out of, even though you feel extremely comfortable doing it, you know, move into something else that um, might be a challenge at first, it might be a complete failure. Um, I found it really liberating moving <coughs> into the horizontal and that I I don't know, it just kind of broke down this architecture in my brain as well that I was able to kind of paint past it. Uh, this is Bungalow, the same size as the last. And so, <clears throat> for me, I was like, I, would, I, I was making decisions at a small scale to 
uh, to sort of complete a painting. So I'd make a mark and then my next decision of color and, and location kind of thing was based on that one. Um, but it, it would also happen when I finished a painting. So if, generally if I had maybe a far too architectural painting, I would kind of edge it into a little bit of more organic. And I kind of like, you know, did this show of like fully architectural things and went directly into this, you know, a little bit of architecture, but a lot of organic, a lot of kind of like living, um, living kind of forms that were living and breathing inside the painting. And I was, I was getting very attracted to areas that felt as if they were a living stroke. Throughout all this, I, I feel like, I guess if I could move back just a touch, because we talked about when the figure removed my, uh, was removed from my work, and, and I think that in the architectural pieces, for sure, that it became very clear that there was definitely not uh, some figuration, and yet I couldn't quite get rid of that. If you can see a figure in there, you're, you've got a good eye, I guess, but I don't know if I can put my, so there's kind of like a back, and there's like two arms and two long legs. You can kind of get that. So that's the kind of like figuration that I'll put into my painting, and it's not really figuration, but it's it's a you know it's a format that I felt comfortable by injecting the figure because it was a, it was able to experience that space at that scale. And for a viewer to see this work, if they were to mend, if they were to notice that figure, then perhaps they were to experience that painting at that scale as well. This one's like a, kind of this like large kind of figure laying on the bed, like Rob Ford or something, I don't know, but <laughs> whatever. It's, it, it, for me, that was a figure, and that was kind of this living structure that things were built around. a really yellow painting. It's not that yellow, but whatever. So these were kind of like, I guess, uh, works done just in my studio, sort of nothing to really aim for, um, or you know, no deadline or anything like that. And I came upon, uh, I, I wanted to do a couple of really, really big pieces, and these were um, uh, 86 by 72, which were at the time some of the largest ones that I was able to do in my studio. And this one in particular, called Timber, um, was quite a move into breaking that balance and breaking, uh, well, attempting to anyway, because you st there's still some balance happening, and yet I wanted to become more playful with the oil itself and, you know, attempting this and attempting that and kind of building something um, that wasn't really expected, and I feel like um, I feel like that's one of the hardest things to do as a practicing artist as you continue is being your own teacher. You have, to, you have to take the role of the professor and kind of direct yourself or be surrounded by other painters and be surrounded by friends that can offer you some advice. Um, I don't know, it's, it's really about continuing to learn. Um, and so a lot of these works were sort of a, they just seemed grander to me. They seemed a little bit more uh, more physical and more breaking off the edge. And these were some of the first paintings that I did that actually extended beyond the border of the painting. Um, this one's called Poof. And it's like there's, you know, there's still this, this ungrounding part of it. There's still a uh, uh, kind of a lack of structure to be settled on. And it's all just kind of happening as an active paint uh, kind of an active painting performance, and I, I really was interested in how an audience was able to respond to that kind of activity. To be able to see what the painter's doing, to see what the artist is, you know, actually making a mark and, and doing this and doing that. Um, I'm not so much for one of like hiding a process. I like to I like to really show it and be like, this is this is my work and this is how I'm working in a studio. Um, Although I do light work that, that, that you know is kind of mysterious as well, 
Uh, there's a different kind of mystery with, with this kind of work, I suppose. Um, so th this is a work called Calm Passing On, and it's um, uh, 50 by 55. And this was done for my second solo show at Gallery at Swap Point. Um, I mean, I do want to mention that, like, you know, I was, I was advised by many to, you know, just to kind of sit back and wait. Um, as much as, you know, people came over to have studio visits and, you know, I'd be contacted by somebody or I would contact somebody for them to come by uh, to see the work, it was really a kind of a time to just, like, um, just kind of weigh all the options and not pushing it into anything too hard. Um, the relationship that I built with my Montreal dealer in 2009, I still have, and it's stronger than ever. And it's kind of one of those things that you, um, you know, may get involved in, and it's it's like a relationship. You kind of like flirt at the beginning, and you start dating, and then you get married, and then you have shows, <laughs> babies. They're like babies. I don't have babies, so I paint. But it's kind of like like you really have to invest in it. And you're expecting them to invest in it as well. And it's kind of one of those uh, things that you just, you have to have the right communication. Some of them don't work. Um, so this was kind of like a break from that balance. And although you might see a kind of a balance in here, there's, there's things weighted differently. It's still architectural. There's still this, uh, this kind of active uh, paintwork happening where um, a little bit, a little bit, it, of it is arbitrary, and a lot of it is sort of this calculated spontaneity. So I started working big. Of course, the, my, the Montreal Gallery, they doubled their space uh, within, between my first and second show. So I was kind of like, holy, what do I do? I have to like kind of have this 3,200 square feet space, and you know, it's, it's kind of an it's kind of bigger than I had ever painted before, and I didn't want to do just small paintings throughout this entire thing. So I actually did some pretty big works. These are like 60 by 70, some of them were 90 by 72, and they were, they were a lot of the biggest works that I've ever done, um, which I felt were um, excellent for me as, a, as like being in my studio and being this close to my work and really getting into the paint and really seeing how it fell and how it dripped and how it clumped up in certain areas. And then I'd be able to st uh, stand back and sort of experience it as a whole. And I knew, like, I, I wanted that experience to be evident to an audience. And I wanted, the, uh, obviously, the entirety of the painting to be experienced in the same way that I experienced it. But there were some things that I, at the time, didn't think were um, were very important to express in things like statements or talking with people about my work. And I mean, there was there was one time, like not one time, but many times, where people would ask me, how long does it take you to paint a work? And for quite a few years, I shied away from explaining how long it took, because they're quite quick. Um, essentially one day paintings, because it's all wet on wet on wet. And I don't like waiting for something to dry and then going back into it, and you've got a completely different um, property. You've got a completely different oil property than you did before. And that immediacy started influencing how I was working with a process. And I really kind of engaged that. And I, because I had so many questions about it, I was like, okay, so why is time important? You know, where does time play into my paintings? And I think that um, because of this kind of quickness of it, and if, if an audience knows that it's a quick painting, they're able to kind of respond to the activity in that painting a little bit easier, maybe. Um, so obviously I did these massive big works that really kind of had these deep expanses of space and things kind of floating around it or on it that were, you know, non-representational. Um, things that could be structures and could be uh, you know, points of architecture to hold things up and yet there's not a lot to hold up. Um, 
you know, maybe little platforms or little steps. Um, all things that, that continue to uh, be influenced by this idea of uh, a fictional space. And I get to this one, and this one is uh, one of the 90 by 72s. Yeah, 90 by 72. And you know, I look back at it now, and I still think it's one of my most successful paintings, but it feels like I maintained uh, like a brush size to fit into that large size of a painting. And at this scale, I guess you don't really, you know, when you're there and you're studying and you're working, you don't necessarily recognize all the options and all the ideas that people may have about a work. And of course, you'd stand back from it and you'd see this, you know, massive kind of textural pattern painting of, of something. And um, I, I think that essentially throughout all the years of, of the MFA and the years after that, I was failing to really address, um, a, a, I think, a pretty key element. And, and a lot of that is, um, oh, that's the show material. And that key element was, after that show, I, I worked down into this small size. This was kind of funny. I went from 90 by 72 all the way down to 12 by 12s. And I don't usually work that size. But it just started filling me with this idea, like, what's going on? There's something a lot different about these works and, and how they're reading to me and how they're reading to an audience in these paintings. And I, as much of, as it was obvious to me, it wasn't out there. It wasn't in my statement. It wasn't in this kind of vernacular that I was talking about. And maybe that's one of those things that you kind of, for, you know, you kind of miss. And maybe you just don't, uh, don't make light of it because it doesn't come to mind. And I feel like that's just the way, that's just the nature of producing, is like you will never know all the answers and you'll come upon these answers, uh, you'll come upon these, these kind of like results just as you work and as you paint. And that kind of like thing that was obvious was the detail, the kind of, the language of paint inside these paintings that were only experienced at a small scale and at a very personal scale. It was personal for me the entire time, and yet it wasn't something that I was translating into uh, being important. And so, you know, as much as like, as much as uh, the feedback and the development that I had during my MFA, as much as as much as I feel like that's a, a very important part of my painting career, um, I feel like one of the most most important discoveries was, you know, just um, I'm going to say about a year and a half ago, and it's been that discovery that I've really kind of exposed and, and really kind of worked on in the last little while. And so these are the kinds of things, like these kind of marks that are just about touching, and they're kind of communicating with each other. And um, it's the it's the nature of paint and the the how paint works and how it doesn't work and all that kind of thing, that, that specific language that I've totally fallen in love with. Um, these were the kind of details that uh, are taken from, you know, obviously a much more, much larger paintings that I wanted to kind of go through a little bit. This is from that, that very big one, uh, 90 by 72. It's those things that are kind of fun as well. It's like there's playfulness in how it how it acts and, and the properties that it has. And I feel like it was created because of the nature of my process and being so immediate. Like I don't know, um, had I made this stroke across and not been happy with it, maybe I'd do it again or rub it out a bit, then I wouldn't have that same kind of, it's like a snap. It's like, that's right there. It's not going to change from there. It just kind of happens. Um, and I guess, I, see, I, I guess another thing that kind of I really worked into, obviously, the idea of time. And I started to harness the, 
and be sort of proud of it in saying that, yes, I do a painting per day. When I sit down to actually do studio work, I dedicate myself to a canvas, and I don't stop until it's done. Being wet oil, like you can, you can maneuver it and you can work with it, and you know, obviously there's failure, and obviously there's things that you don't approve of, and things that you're maybe not happy with, and yet, uh, for, like for the most part, it's sticking with an idea, and sticking with the kind of plan as you're going along and making decisions as you go, and just kind of like staying on it. So what this did for me was it really started to include the audience more into the how the painting is made. And some of the works that I produced following this kind of discovery, I can call it a discovery, but it's, it's just a discovery in the studio that like what's important and what's not. And it was this kind of discovery that led me to, uh, uh, this is from one of my final paintings. And, like, no, I don't have a shaky hand. It's just, that's kind of what I wanted is these just little kind of movements and mark makings. And what I would start to do is really include time into my paintings and time into my strokes because I find painting an extremely meditative process. It's something that I can go to and, um, I mean, I don't want to be cliche, and, oh, I got lost in my paintings. But it's more like I actually can just focus specifically on the making and the craft, which ultimately for, I think everybody in art, should be the most important thing. Um, it was this kind of like meditative process that allowed me to really get into these, these the next set of works after this slide that kind of show, um, I guess, you know, how it's all done. Um, I applied to a residency in Picton called Sparkbox. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it or seen it advertised on Akimbo, but they, they offer like one month or one week or one weekend. So I was like, I can do a weekend. Let me drive up to Picton. Let's get out of my studio into a different setting and let's do work on paper. And because of this kind of previous discovery that I thought was important to my work, I did all works on nine, uh, it's like nine, nine by 11 on paper. And it was the first time I'd worked on paper before. Um, so it was kind of a new process. I taped things off, and that's full size. It's not in detail. Um, and I just got, you know, playing. Playing in terms of where, you know, how color works and how uh, certain lines and marks kind of uh, communicate with each other. Of course, coming back from this uh, this residency, uh, getting back into the studio, preparing some paintings, and knowing that you know having that kind of confidence, like yeah, I've kind of like I've kind of nailed something a little bit in my practice. I want to expose that on a on a larger level. And after these small drawings came, and I guess it was about simplicity too. Really, it was about kind of creating an environment with this few marks as possible. And it's funny because something inside me is just like, oh, that work is too simple, or that's too easy, or something. And there was always this kind of like uh, conversation that I would have in my heart about art, not just painting, but sculpture and, and whatever, drawing as well. And, and sometimes I would shy away from works that were too simple and too, uh, I mean, I was never like, oh, I can do that. It was never like that, but it was like uh, seeing the process and understanding it was kind of like, okay, moving on, rather than uh, really getting into it. And I actually started doing that and started working with like these really simple, immediate strokes and just seeing how I was still able to develop this space with as few marks as possible. Um, and so it came onto these big works, and these are quite large. These are, well, not so big, but 40 by 44, around 50 by 50. Um, and I think it was my intention to really take an audience and just pull them closer to that process and pull them closer into the spaces that I was creating in the past. But rather, you know, in, instead of being these environments that you experience from afar and you're looking at it and you're seeing it, 
you're actually stepping into it and you're becoming part of that painting. You're, um, there's a much more in your face attitude about the strokes and the brushwork and the paint. Um, there's 14 strokes in this painting. Aside from the background, because the background takes probably four hours to produce and just to kind of blend and to get it right, it's sort of the development of this, you know, very linear painting stroke movement that, uh, you know, takes on takes on a character of uh, it could be parts of architecture, it could be beams, it could be uh, rays of light, even it could be trees. Like those are the kinds of ambiguous things that I was still interested in, and yet, you know, maintaining this abstraction. Of course, some got quite busy. Some got very full with information. Some got a lot flatter than others. Some were extremely deep, but um, they did become uh, full of this full of this language that I was very familiar with that I really wanted to share. So I found like I found in these works like the essence. Like, the essence of this fictional environment still exists. But because it is front center and a little more visible and a little more obvious, then it takes on a little bit more of an attitude. There's a little bit more happening with, um, I guess, representational space and the surface itself and how one is kind of reacting to uh, the, the paint materiality, um, how light is reflecting off these dark surfaces, like, that's actually weird. <laughs> it's all right. Um, and of course, like, you know, you, you obviously play with some things. You, you try to decide how simple can you go? How far can you go without, um, you know, ruining something? So obviously there's some that are, are quite busy and some that are extremely simple. <coughs> Um, it was around this time that I applied for my, I applied for the RBC five times in a row, um, getting in at the first, second, and the fifth time. Um, so this was the painting that was, uh, after applying, got into the RBC for the fifth time. Um, not fifth time, third time. Which, I don't know, I was, um, I was just hanging out on a Saturday, and they called me, and it was just kind of, it's a little bit unbelievable, like, come on, really? Like there's some other people that can that have fantastic paintings that I know as friends even in Toronto that are doing work that is, and so it's kind of, it was kind of weird to be in it a third time almost. And even though I feel really really lucky to be in it, it was a time that I was almost kind of shy to be there. Like I don't know, it was a it was strange, but amazing obviously to be in it again. Um, and I think from, I guess from one of these pieces, like, you're really able to see this kind of active, um, this active space that's kind of playing with the back and forth and playing with surface and playing with, with depth. Um, this one being my, I think the most recent painting that I've done, which is a, a 60 by 66. So, I mean, I feel like, I feel like the work itself Throughout the years following my, my master's degree, it has become far more abstract than anything. And um, I think I continue to explore, and obviously there's, there's kind of never any end to it. It's just a, a, the idea of producing and producing. Um, so it's these abstract marks that are sort of in your face of what's happening, and you're involved in that process, and the audience becomes almost a participant in how the work is created, like it's not hiding from you. And yet it's these abstract strokes that, I guess in essence, you're, are, are being drawn out of that environment. Like you, you're being brought into the environment to experience it, and yet you're pushed back against it because you know, of how the paint is sitting on the canvas and how um, you know, it's kind of a removal from the abstract. Um, and I, and I guess, like like I said, it's it's kind of one of those things where, as a painter, I'm continuously making decisions based on what I've done before, whether that's at a minute scale with individual strokes, 
or it's at a large scale by making a shift between painting to painting. Um, I'm not one for working on a paint on more than one painting at a time. I feel like um, a single surface commands the attention for a painter, um, and may, that's just kind of how I approach approach works. I feel like fiction will always be a part of it, and it's always going to be involved in how I structure paintings and how I, I approach paintings and how they're influenced. Um, and I think ultimately, like, and as, as hard as it is to step away from your work and to look at your work completely objectively, like, you know, like someone else's shoe, like, how do you how do you look at your own work objectively? It's really tough. Um, like I, I try to, I try to truly do that in the studio, and I obviously hope everybody would do that as well. And it's like the immediacy of this paint and the marks that that I'm making now that they're important in my practice. It's almost, it's almost like they're forced into seeing um, and into experiencing the relationships of paint to paint and how they work on a canvas. So that's kind of where I'm at. And um, I think that's uh, like that's the last slide in my show. I um, have a show coming up at Tom Thompson, which is kind of the next thing, but that's not until 2015. So it's kind of one of those things where you just you know keep producing and, and see what happens next. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. So in the beginning, you were talking about narratives, and they're in fictional narratives. And I'm wondering how much you thought your way through that. I could actually see a fair bit of thinking about it in relation to the paintings in terms of it being a sort of nebulous or subconscious space, or mm -hmm. kind of a stage and an entrance of a primary form in front, in front of it, which I think is a very much in that fictional narrative device. Um, I, I feel like before, like I would say around 2010, 2011, I was using um, these fictional stories as like a heavy influence on the body of work, I would say. Um, and yet, the act of painting and the act of completing a work it's not like I'd be looking at notes and reading parts of the novel to kind of like influence that. It was more like um, it was more like once that was finished, and I, I kind of like you know put that in my pocket into the studio, and that felt like something that I could draw on um, by completing the whole. It's a very different situation, I think, when you get into you know when I got into the marks and you know what would influence this mark as opposed to that one or this one. Um, I mean, I knew that I wanted, for example, the story of uh, the stone raft, right? I, I wanted this idea that like these environments and spaces that I paint are not going to have a grounding. They're going to be all temporary spaces, and a lot of it is kind of, you know, just kind of navigating slowly and piecing things together, almost like I'm the architect and I'm kind of building these structures. Uh, it's not like a you know, it's kind of like an unskilled architect, but I'm still kind of piecing it all together. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm curious, given the direction that your work is taking, what artists do we have? What artists? Yeah. Um, my God, there's so many. There's uh, filmmakers, there's... Ulf Putter is a fantastic painter. The uh, Leipzig School, fantastic painting. Um, Tamori Dodge in LA. Tamori Dodge, check him out. He's a cool painter. Um, Dana Schatz is a fantastic colorist. David Cronenberg. You know, like, I think, um, I think it's hard to. Point. It's kind of funny because I, I, I've received that question a few times and I've just been like, yeah. Because <laughs> it's not like there's a list made up. It's like, like I can think about going through my books and through notes and you know possibly pulling up some things. But yeah, 
Mori Dodge is, a, is one of them for sure. Check them out. that kind of, uh, that intimate discovery of this kind of language, and, and I, I'm not, I don't want to say it's a discovery for me, because I experienced it the whole time. It was like part of that painting process throughout, you know, my MFA and throughout the, the next five years, and it's, but it's one of those things that I, instead of being down here on the list of importance of painting, it suddenly became one of the most important things, and I think because of that, by drawing an audience into a work and, for example, making strokes larger and making them more deliberate and more obvious um, and, and keeping the mystery out of the production of the painting, like, I don't know, just, you know, that, that became an extremely important part for me and I think it did influence these resulting paintings because of that just kind of like now, you know. Like this top stroke here, like a, I mean, just for an example, this one here, I think I did it maybe four times. And you can kind of see the mistake in the back where it just wasn't hanging right. Like I kind of did it the first time and I looked at it and I'm like, well, there's got to be a bit of physics in my painting that makes it feel like a real space. It can't have this plasticky, like, oh, it's not really hanging, it's just stuck there. Um, yeah, so I did it maybe two more times just over top of it, trying to get it right. In the meantime, making this big, like, yellowish splash right there that wasn't intended, but it just kind of happened. And some of it came down there, too, but... Yeah. Thanks very much, Scott. You're welcome.